to be or boast of worldly fame. They have all received their Pentecost, baptized in Jesus' name, and are telling now both far and His power is yet the same. I'm so glad that I can say. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our only and supreme Lord, him whom we worship. May I remind you that tomorrow, the 1st of June, will be Pentecost Day. And if you still haven't received the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, this is your time to cry out. Please notice that on the international prophetic stage, for the first time since Israel has become a nation, they have a split government. For the first time, two men will rule. And please notice that both men are called Benjamin. Could this be a sign that little Benjamin, the 144,000, is about to receive two witnesses of Revelation 11, 3? I leave it to you and to the Holy Spirit to impress whether these things be so. Our scripture reading for part three of calculations is Second Peter three verses fifteen and sixteen, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Here's where I want to pick it up from. Even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which, here's my emphasis, in which are some things hard to be understood. There are certain quotations today in the message, very hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned, meaning not taught by the Holy Spirit, and unstable ones, we've seen quite a few on the internet, they wrestle, rest, they wrestle the scriptures, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. We have shared with you the quotation from Questions and Answers, 1962, 0527, paragraph 238, 
where the prophet says we punctuate with an amen every punctuation every hyphen every period meaning full stop every comma the way it is written that is why our blessed prophet always said when you write down what you believe when you tabulate your constitution or your belief you must never end it with a full stop you must always put a comma he was again teaching us that punctuations are very important here is my first example our technicians are going to put it up before you don't which is d o n comma t with an exclamation mark don't and then the next word run in other words whatever they were planning to do to hide to jump you are saying don't and then you give them the way out run the way you place that exclamation mark makes a world's difference in the next statement don't run exclamation mark by moving the exclamation mark in the first example you are telling them run don't do what you are planning to do run but the second one by moving the exclamation mark to the end of the two words don't run you are saying stay put so it's becoming very clear then that a punctuation like the example we gave could mean stay put or run for your life the next statement is also to do with punctuations. Here goes. People don't forget you. They just forget to remember you. We have already given you the quotation in the last two services where the prophet says, I like the King James Bible. So our part three is going to be based on the King James Version, publication 1611, 1611. In Genesis 1, verse 1, and you read up to verse 2, I'm interested in the verse 2 that says, and it was without foam. It was void and without foam. Without foam and void. We are not told how long the earth stood after God created the heavens and the earth full stop. That is why our prophet teaches that if they come up with some rock and they say it's millions and millions of years old, he says, what's wrong with that? Because the earth stood for many, many years before God began to say, let there be. So the Hebrew words for without form and void are T-O-F-U, and B-O-H-U. Tofu, Bohu. Tofu means without form. Bohu means and void. I know message people very well. I've been among them for 47 years now. 46 years a minister. 47 years in the message. They may say, can you help me out with a quotation as to the statements you've just made 
yes. If you go to the spoken word is the original C booklet. And because I'm an old hand, I'm a Madala, Undara, I quote from the old copies as we received them in the early 70s. So spoken word is the original seed, it'll be page 10. And the sealed, seven seals book, old copy, page 292. You'll come across the statements of just me. So you see, the way the earth is made, the prophet says, is exactly the way he made our bodies that we now live in. The earth has got mountains and valleys. We also have curvatures. You've got a nose that sticks out, and you've got the eyes that are in some sockets. You have your undulations. The earth has got rivers, you've got veins. The earth sometimes has earthquakes. People get strokes. On and on and on, you at the Willows Assembly in my church in Pretoria, we have preached these things to you. So when the earth was without form and void, it reminds me of George Martin, that's me, when I was in the womb of my mother's earth, you see? When I was in the womb of my mother's earth, long before the days of X-ray and women going in before time to find out if it's a boy or a girl, I was in her womb, without form, and I was void. But in 1952, I came out of that earth. <coughs> I was born. But it was only in 1973, February, that I began to hear, let there be. <coughs> and the let there be was when I heard the first two tapes preached by the prophet of the untrained. The seed is not there with a shock. And recognizing your day. In Hebrew, <clears throat> let the be is yehi. Y-E-H-Y, one word. Y-E-H-I, yehi. Let the be. You see, let the B, Yahi, its alphabets come to 25. Two, five. Is it not amazing that Sarah and Abram, Sarah's womb was without form and void? Is it not amazing? Is it not powerful? Is scripture not precise? That after 25 years, Yehi, Isaac came on the scene. And is it not also amazing that in Genesis 25, you read of the record of Abram fathering more sons through Hatura, six more sons, because Yehi equals 25. <clears throat> the same thing happened to you. <clears throat> You were in the womb of your mom's earth. And the prophet says in 1965, things that are to be, paragraph 52, 5, 2. He speaks about God breathes into the soul or breathes the soul into the body. And <clears throat> the baby is born, but while the baby is born, there is a spiritual body to receive. That explains children who die at birth or children who die a few hours or days after they are born, they simply come out of the natural body, Brother Benham says, because there is a spiritual body 
that I wasted. The prophet taught it so well. And who is this Melchizedek, 965? I'm just quoting at random when he says, we came from the mind of God. We came from thought. Then we bypassed that theophany. Then we came into a body of flesh. So it makes sense then that if you are elect and you die in childbirth or before or a little after, you go back to the body that you bypassed. But the theophany is not the ultimate plan. The theophany in God's plan was to fuse with a natural body and therefore become glorified for us to live in the millennium and in the new world eternally. Here is something I'd like to share with you under punctuations. We read very well in Genesis 2 and 22 that after God formed Adam into a body of flesh, he breathed into his nostrils and Adam became a living soul. So what was Adam before, before he became a living soul? He was a spirit man, well alive. He is called a living soul because now he is captured in a body. He is enveloped in a body. But we are not told that after God formed Eve out of the rib, he breathed into the rib. You'll never find the scripture. So how is it then that Eve continued to live? Here's the mystery. When he breathed into Adam, the rib was already in him. So when that body of Adam began to live, the rib was alive too. So when God took the rib to form Eve, her life continued from the rib that came from Adam. That is why after Jesus resurrects, before he gives them the baptism of the Holy Ghost, in John 20, 22, I see it now. He breathed on the bosom, the church, the New Testament Eve. Because he breathed only into Adam, now he breathes into Eve in John 20, 22. So Eve's life was hidden in Adam. That is why Colossians 3 and verse 3 says, We are dead, but our life is hid in Christ. There it is, the church typing Eve. The church's life hid in Adam, in the rib. That is why the Roman soldier had to pierce the fifth rib for the materials to come out, the materials that form Eve today, the church, the bride. We promised you last Sunday that we would find in the scripture that proves that man in the body, man in the flesh, is the highest form of God's creation formation. Our technicians will put it up. It's Proverbs 8, 26. Proverbs 8, 26 says, we are the highest part of the dust of the world. The body we live in is nothing but dust. You must listen very carefully. That is why God reminded Adam that out of dust was thou made. Therefore, when you die, the outer man, unto dust he returns. So where does the inner man go to? If you are elect, you return back to God the maker. But I want to slot in a beautiful thought even before we get to it, which is Isaiah 65, 25. I'll come back to it. When the scripture says, and dust will be the serpent's meat, food. Have you ever noticed that that scripture is very mysterious 
it's again back to punctuations. Natural serpents feed on mice, rats, frogs. The pythons, which we know who it is, they'll eat a human, if needs be, they'll eat bucks, calves. So when do they eat the dust? Well, when you take it back to Satan is called an old serpent in the book of Revelation. You clearly see how Satan feeds the serpent. Satan feeds on dust today. He attacks this natural dust, gives it all kinds of cancers, all kinds of diseases, all kinds of lupus, all kinds. Satan, through his diseases, is feeding on this dust. But very soon, he'll have nothing more to eat. When these bodies are changed and we go back to God. So we might as well remind Satan that very soon he will be quarantined. His restaurants will be closed. He'll be quarantined for a thousand years when we have the millennium. And thereafter he'll be judged. And he'll be quarantined and destroyed forever. Now, some critics say we cannot trust the Bible when it says that Adam was the first man on earth. And they advance Genesis 4.16 as their argument. They say when Cain was banished, he went to the land of Nod, N-O-D. And without further research, they conclude that Nod is a human being. It's again back to punctuations. The word Nod is directly Hebrew. The translators took a Hebrew word and put it there. The land of Nod, Nod N-A-D in Hebrew means the land of emptiness, not a land that belonged to somebody, Nod. That's why today, unfortunately, you do have people called Nadim. I wouldn't suggest that name for any child because it would mean the child of emptiness. So Nod is not a human being. Nod is the area from the word Nod, which means emptiness. Now, we want to look at Deuteronomy 34, 3, 4, verses 5 and 6. I'm going to paraphrase it, but the technicians will put it up for you. Please notice the following points. It says Moses died. Number two, but there is no grave. And it says he buried him. Who was he? buried him and then no man knows his grave hold it the one who buried him should know what the grave is right but look at punctuations it says no man knows his grave it means he who buried him is no man god did the burying do you see that punctuation if you read carelessly you will miss it says he buried him no man knows the grave then it goes on to say he buried him no man knows the grave who's he he is a man but it proves to you in punctuation that he there is not a man but god then we see moses alive is alive in matthew 17 then we see Moses dies in Revelation 11, 7. So how can you find the grave of a living man before he dies? But the answer comes with our blessed prophet. And who is this Melchizedek? 1965, paragraph 89. 
He says, angels buried Moses. He there is, angels took him. That's why you don't find his grave. But believe me, someday when you go to Israel, <clears throat> and I hope to be your guide, when you come to the area where they last saw Moses, there are so many churches around there, Greek Orthodox here, Roman Catholic over there, and they all are fighting over saying that they found the grave of Moses. It's laughable because God cannot lie. The Bible says no man knows the grave. And then we find out Moses died, but he really never died. God took him. Amen. Now, as we proceed with punctuations, we wanted to look at Genesis 17, 17. And Abraham laughed. Why did he laugh? <clears throat> it's after God told him, I'll give you a son. When that very same God comes in Genesis 18, 12, and repeats the promise to Abraham, maybe as a backup, because sometimes we need to hear something more than once. He told him in Genesis 17, I'll give you that son. He again repeats in Genesis 18, but in verse 12, Sarah loves and God intervenes. People have asked, <clears throat> why didn't God censure Abram when he loved? Why didn't God correct Abram for laughing? Why is it when Sarah laughs, she gets corrected? Punctuations. And as our scripture reading said, if you wrestle these scriptures without proper balance, you'll end up thinking that God favors men over women. In the baptism of the Holy Ghost, there's no male, there's no female. Dying on the cross for the salvation of souls, there's no male, there's no female. But in ruling the house and ruling the church, God is very clear. But let's address the question. It is when you look at the tape, <clears throat> the reproach for the word of God, <clears throat> 1962, 1223. And I'm quoting the old book. The reproach for the word, the old book in page 31, Brother Benham tells you why <clears throat> Abram laughed and God said nothing. There was a difference in punctuations between the two laughters. Abram laughed out of joy. <clears throat> Abram saw the vision of himself holding that boy. It was a laugh of praise the Lord. Here he is after 25 years. But Sarah's love was based on the condition of the body. She brought it down to a lower level. She said, I'm old. <clears throat> she looked at the condition of her natural body and said, this son cannot come. The willows, you've heard me over the years, I repeat. Today's message people, Sarah in type, are losing their faith just before this promised son comes to fetch us. They are looking at the condition of the body message believers. They are saying, how can this rapture be when such and such is doing this, so and so is saying that, and that group is doing this, and those are broken away from the message, Look away from the condition of the body. Look at the promise. Maybe we need him to come and say it again for the second time, like he said it to Abraham. We showed you last week that in Genesis 23, 19, we don't have to read it. Abraham, by inspiration, chose the cave of Machpelah. Our technicians are going to put Machpelah before you. M-A-C-H-P. But I want the Elah to be bigger in letters 
E L A H, Makpila. Notice that the last four alphabets spell Allah. The same you find in Psalms 24, verse 10, when David says something and he says, Sila. You can write the S-E in smaller letters or the S in smaller letters and the Ila in the same size as Makhpila. So I want to make a point. And the point is, Brother Brennan says these patriots knew that the resurrection will be in the land of Israel. So even in the choosing of the cave, it has Elah at the end. Because in adoption part one, 1960, 0, 0515, paragraph 99, the prophet goes through the pain to identify him as E L L Yala. There it is, Elohim. It was a far type hidden in punctuations that if we die in Christ, our Elohim, our Lord Jesus Christ, we will definitely rise. It does not matter where in the earth you are buried or cremated. So we know now from Joshua 24, 32, we read it last week, that Joseph was buried in Shechem. But a beautiful question came through between last service and this one. Why? Why of all the patriarchs, <clears throat> Abram, Isaac, Jacob, they're buried in Machpelah in Hebron, why is Joseph buried in Shechem? We know that he commanded they should not leave his bones in Egypt. Could he have also commanded in that command, punctuations, that bury me in Shechem? Before we give you the answer, because for every Bible question, the prophet says there's a Bible answer. For every quotational question, there must be a quote to answer it. Our technicians will put up John 4, verses 4, 5, and 6. I will paraphrase it. Jesus meets the woman, the Samaritan, mixed race, at the well. The Bible clearly to prove the precision of God's word tells you that there was a parcel of land. Remember Jacob paid a hundred shekels for a parcel of land in Shechem. And there, watch how precise scripture is. Jesus is going to meet a mixed race woman. How many of you remember that Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, a mixed race. Jewish seed with a seed of ham, Essenet. Could it be in the wisdom of God? God who foreknows the future. And the Samaritan mixed race woman is in the election. Joseph comes, they bury his bones in Shechem. Could God have been laying the foundation that I will save this mixed race woman, the woman of the well? The reason is this. When they brought the bones of Joseph and buried them in Shechem, Joseph types Christ. It's almost like he's saying, I died for them too. But here's your answer. Why was Joseph buried in Shechem? John 4 verse 5 clearly says, the piece of land, the parcel of land that Jacob gave to Joseph. There's a secret why he was buried there. 
The answer comes in John 4 verse 5 because that parcel of land was given to him. Now we have another question. We know that Sarah was buried in Machpelah. Rebecca was buried in Machpelah. Leah was buried in Machpelah. But Rachel is buried in Bethlehem. And where is Esenath buried there? There you go. If Joseph, the husband, is buried in Shechem, why do we not read where Esenath's bones are buried? We are not told. But here's a beautiful punctuation. God hiding it and revealing it to those who are elected. The last time we read and hear of Esenath, was when she was dismissed from the palace before Joseph revealed himself to his brethren. And Asenath's dismissal, the prophet clearly says, type of the rapture. That's why you don't hear of Asenath's burial place. She types the bride that will not be buried. You see, sometimes when the scripture omits certain things, does not speak of certain things, leave certain things out, it's called the mystery answer in the omission. By not saying it, by letting it go into silence, because her name is Esenath. It starts with an A for S and not seven alphabets, seven church ages, and it ends with a silent vowel, Senath, a symbol of the rapture. You see, punctuations are not only little marks that you make in your letter when you write it. Punctuations can also be how you say things. Here is a good example. The husband on a Monday morning, it can be Tuesday, it can be Wednesday, but it was on this morning, he's running late for work and he's opening drawers and closing doors, drawers, opening doors, pulling chairs, looking on the table. And he says, I can't find, I can't find my car and office keys again. I repeat. I can't find my car and office keys again. The wife replies from the other corner, it's in your jeans. The husband turns around and says, don't go attacking my family again. Leave their jeans out of it. What she meant was the pocket of the Levi jeans not the genes of ancestry. Punctuation. Now here we come to Isaiah 65, 25, as we said a while ago, that the serpent's meat will be dust. It creates a question. Will the serpent be upright in the garden? Because he was upright before he was told, upon thy belly thou shalt go. Let me repeat that. Because I was under the impression I'm only talking to the Church of the Willows. It is now emerging that we have people listening in from around the world. It definitely puts a lot of pressure on me because when I speak to the willows, I know what I have taught them already. I can just say a thing and move on. They have seen the quotes. So if I say the serpent was upright, will he be upright again? It might be new to somebody somewhere as they are listening in. But when you read Genesis, which I'm not going to go into. He was a man because the Bible says when he spoke to Eve, he said unto her, he, not it. 
he was a man before he became a reptile. And why would God say, upon thy belly thou shalt go, if he was a reptile already? No, he was upright. He could speak the human language. Now the question comes, since this Eden we are headed to, the millennium, the 1,000 years of the book of Revelation, why is the millennium coming back? Because the first one was interrupted. In that day when Adam was resting and God was resting, the serpent interrupted that rest. And God had to say, in that day you eat, a day with the Lord is a thousand years. You will die in that 1,000 years. Now since sin is removed, Christ has paid the price. God, hallelujah, blessed be his holy name. Having removed death, sicknesses and all he now brings back that day we will spend 1000 years on earth with Christ uninterrupted because the devil will be bound see the serpent was not bound in eden that's why he caused the problem now he'll be bound but the question is will he walk upright again I have a quotation for you. The cruelty of sin. 1953, 04, 03, paragraph 98. If you punch in the words, he can't back up on it. Can't must have a C and apostrophe T. He can't back up on it. A quote comes up where the prophet answered the question that the serpent will not walk upright in the millennium. His punishment continues. But the reptiles will be there. Remember, reptiles were created by God. When God says all the creeping things, he includes your numbers, your cobras, they are in the original creation. It is a python that is not in the original creation because he was between man and beast. The python is actually an intruder into the serpentine kingdom. And because he used his body for the purpose of Satan's agenda, he won't walk upright again, says the prophet. God can't pick up on his word. Now we come to the question of Adam and Eve. Did they have belly buttons? No, the prophet says in key to the door in our next teaching. In key to the door, which we will bring you later, he says Adam and Eve did not have belly buttons because they did not come out of any woman. From their children, Cain and them, they had belly buttons, and so do you today, still. Now the question is, will the glorified body that we are going into for the millennium and the new world have a belly button? No, because those don't come out of a woman. The only one with the belly button is the one we are in now. That is why God says, come out of them, my people, or even come out of her, my people. There is a woman in Revelation 17. The Bible calls her a mother. So denominations are children. That's why they are tied to the mother in their doctrines, their umbilical, umbilical cords, the back to part. The umbilical cords are still tied to the mother doctrines. That is why God says, come out of her, my God. So the new birth makes the church a new entity altogether. We are going into bodies that will not have the belly button. Now, before we close, Brother Benham says the eating of that book, John eating the book is a symbol of the bride in this hour eating on that word because the book 
in its fullness was not in Paul, Irenaeus, Martin, Columba, Luther, Wesley. The book in its fullness is in our day, John the Bright. That is why of all the four beasts, Matthew, Lion, Mark, the ox, Luke, the man, John, the eagle, all the first three beasts are earthbound. The eagle is the only one that flies into the skies, a symbol of the last day bright John will be raptured. Let us look at a few scriptures before we terminate and we will continue with part four. When you read Luke 3.23, and our technicians will put it up before you, Luke 3.23, it records Joseph as the son of Heli, H-E-L-I. Watch punctuation. But when you read Matthew 1, 16, it says, Jacob begat Joseph, the same Joseph, the husband of Mary. So those who do not watch punctuations end up thinking, how can Joseph have two fathers, Heli and Jacob? It's punctuations. In Matthew 1, 16, it brings in the biological. It says, Jacob beget. So the real father of Joseph is Jacob, Matthew 1, 16. But in Luke 3, 23, it does not say beget. Because Heli was Mary's father. Therefore, Joseph, by marrying Mary, was a son in law. No contradiction, it's punctuations. Now, for God to prepare the lineage or lineage or ancestry for Mary and Joseph to come from the tribe of Judah, don't miss this. It's hidden in Matthew 1, verse 6. After it says, Jesse beget David, David beget Solomon. Watch that. It puts Solomon in Matthew 1, verse 6. It's preparing the ancestry for Joseph. But when it prepares the ancestry for Mary in Luke 3, 31, it doesn't say David, Solomon. It says David, Nathan. Oh my, God taking the sons of David, he had many, but it takes Solomon from David to pursue the ancestry for Joseph, the husband of Mary, then takes the other son, Nathan, the son of David, son of Jesse, to pursue the line for Mary. Oh my, I love punctuations. I love the precision of scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. Give me Matthew 6, verse 10. Where they said, Lord, teach us to pray. And in Matthew 6, verse 10, I'm interested in these words. Thy kingdom come. Watch the punctuation. Thy kingdom come. The same prayer. In Luke 17, 21, not the same prayer, rather, later when Jesus is with his disciples, in Luke 17, 21, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. <coughs> Luke 17, 21. Now, the critic again says, I'm confused, they say. Pentecost hadn't come yet, they say. We know that the Holy Spirit, the kingdom of God, entered them at Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. So how could he in Luke 17, 21 say the kingdom is within you when he hadn't died yet? It's to do with punctuations. The word within is from the Hebrew word that says is in your midst now. 
it's in your midst now. Not meaning I'm inside of you. Me, the kingdom that will come to fill you with the Holy Ghost. I am with you now. I'm in your midst now. I'm within your midst. But at Pentecost, he entered within them. Sometimes it's how we speak, folks. Punctuation can be how you modulate your voice. Sometimes how you swing your hands, how you move your eyes. Punctuation goes into a lot of things. You've heard me say, you can say to your wife, I love you. It's a punctuation. I love you. Three words. But if you say, I love you, you see, punctuation changes the meaning. You've heard me at the Willows use this one. A woman gives birth to twins. She cannot afford to celebrate their birthdays until they are 20 years of age. However, on the day of the 20 years birthday, we are sitting with a, with a problem, a quandary. Why? Because the one twin is 20 and the other is 22. Before our technicians put it up, the correct answer, those of you who have not heard this before at the Willows, you are sitting with a headache saying, how can they be twins if one is 20 and the other one is 22? Now the technicians will put it up. That is punctuation. They are both 20. The other one is 22, T-O-O. -O. Somebody asked me a very good question before we taper down, wind up. Pastor, in Matthew eleven thirteen, the Bible says the law and the prophets were until John. Correct? Then they say, Pastor, then why are you and the rest of these message ministers are preaching a prophet in the end time? When I read Matthew eleven thirteen, the law and the prophets were until John. Punctuations. Technicians will put up Matthew 23, 34. Matthew 23, 34, the very same book of Matthew. The one is 11, 13. The other one is 23, 34. He says, behold, I send you wise men. I send you, you see? But then he says, I send you prophets. The very same one who said, the law and the prophets were until John. He doesn't say it's the end of prophets. Because in Revelation 22, 9, 22, 9, John wanted to worship the man who was mapping out the new city, revealing these things. And the man responded in Revelation 22, 9, don't worship me. I am of thy fellow seven, the prophets. So then what happened with punctuation? When it says the law and the prophets were until John, it should be the law and the prophets were fulfilled in Jesus, pending what Jesus will tell us more. And that's why the very same Jesus, in whom all the prophets and the laws were fulfilled, he then continues and says in Matthew 23, 34, I will send you prophets. He has another one quickly. In 1 Timothy 2.15, a verse that is very misunderstood, especially by men, she shall be saved in childbearing. Oh, they love that verse. They say the woman must, the woman must just keep having children. But you forget the next verse. It says, if she continues in faith. So what is Paul saying here, punctuations? When it says saved in child, singular, bearing, Paul is looking back to Genesis 3.15, how that the seed that will save the woman in Eden and the rest of us, that child, 
that will one day come through a woman will be our salvation. Not the woman keeps giving birth, keeps giving birth. She said, if childbearing, birthing children saves a woman, then Christ died in vain. Then we have a problem. What about the sisters who are barren, but they believe they are not saved? Punctuations. Scriptures must be applied correctly. Well, let's go into the quotes before I let you go. When we look into the quotes, we'll continue next week. A man, when the prophet of God said, God is going to give me a son, his name will be Joseph. Time lapsed, time passed, and Sarah came on the scene. God blessed our sister Sarah. We love her. Then the man, not understanding God's punctuations, thought he could change the punctuations. He mockingly said, you meant Josephine. And the man has since died. Punctuation. I'm going to close with three quotations and we will continue with part four. When you punch in the words, seven voices, capstone, capstone, one word, seven voices, capstone, a quote comes up from the reproach of the word. I think it's paragraph 47, tape 62, 12, 23. Here is one quotation that is not read, popularly read, by a certain group of message believers who follow a certain brother from the USA. Because this quotation puts seven voices in the capstone and this group of people mercy on them lord they preach seven voices from below the capstone i don't deny that there are seven virtues there are also voices but the prophet didn't stop there he had them went on to say 23rd of december 1962 he says now I'm headed to another seven, which is in the capstone. That is why one week thereafter, which is the 30th of the 12th, 1962, serves as this the time he repeated it. He says the pyramid is kept by seven thunders. You don't wear your cap on your shoulder, part of the lower body. You, you don't wear your cap on your elbow. You don't wear your cap on your knees. You don't wear your cap on your feet. The cap is on the head. And Brother Benham called that the seven thunders. That's why when the cloud came, in Christ is the mystery of God revealed. You can look it up. You can punch the words. Look, Life Magazine, Pact, P-A-C-K-E-D. That pillar of light up there. And he says, he, God showed those thunders up there. That's the capstone, folks. As I close, is it not amazing? One scripture, one quote, and we go. We will continue next Sunday. In John 4, 23, the Lord Jesus makes a statement that has puzzled me for years. He is at the well of Jacob in Shechem with that predestinated, elected, mixed race woman. Woman at the well, we don't know her name. And he says to her, John 4, 23, the hour is and the hour cometh, or the hour cometh and now is. He puts a statement in the future as well as present tense, correct? The very same prophet was asked the question about the seven thunders. Notice, you know how he put it? He says the opening of those seven seals, that's what the thunders was about. It's in questions and answers in 1964. 
COD Volume 2. The opening of those seven seals, that's what the thunders was about. You don't need any interpretation. He's telling you the opening of the seals. That's what the thunders was about. And the seals didn't come in 62 when he preached the virtues. The seals came in 63 when the cloud came down. It's becoming so plain. For anybody to deny what the prophet says, it's like somebody who runs into a basement, shuts themselves up and says the sun is not shining. Now the, the light is shining clear that the thunders are the capstone. But then as I close, after he said, the opening of those seals, that's what the thunders are about. And let me give it to you, the quote. You can punch in the exact words, thunders was about, exact phrase, 1964, 8.30. 6408030, 0, questions and answers, paragraph 78. He looks back and says, that's what the thunders was about, because this is 64, he's looking back to 63. But he amazes me in 1965, last quote. You punch in the words, wait, opening, plagues, thunders, wait, opening, plagues, thunders. In the message, knows it not. Paragraph 169. Tape 650815. He seems to put the thunders in the future. He says, wait until I get to open those plagues and those thunders. There's punctuations before we go. The one quote, it's opened in the seals. Over here, he sounds like, wait until I open those thunders. What is happening here? Don't miss it, don't miss it, don't miss it. It's the same son of man of John 4. As he spoke to the woman in the well, he said that the hour is and is coming. We know what the thunders are, yes. But we are waiting for the thunders to do something in the changing of our bodies. Because Brother Benham says, the seven thunders will be rapturing faith to the bride. God bless you for now, till we speak to you again next Sunday. Shalom.